unless you're going to teach me how to play guitar because I can't get those songs correct. <laughs> you're playing them right. I know you are. You <laughs> Jesus paid it all. It is finished. You know, when he said that and he gave up his spirit, we don't know exactly what happened. Peter talks about him going down to Hades, going down to hell. Not sure how to comprehend that. There's many things. I'm sorry. Your pastor, I just admit defeat when I don't know. I accept it by faith. I don't know. I don't know what he did. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, and it, you know, when it comes to revelations, when it comes to what's going to happen, there's a lot of things I don't know. And I accept it by faith. I don't know how to describe the Trinity to you. You know, there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're all equal. They're all one. You know, it doesn't add up when you know algebra, right? But I know this. My Savior lives, and He is here right now, and He has given us all life instead of death. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, not long, because there's turkeys cooking. Father God, thank you, thank you, thank you, on behalf of all of us, thank you, thank you. We cannot thank you enough, Lord. We can give you every last breath and all of our money and all of our time and it will not even come close to thanking you properly. And Lord, we love you because you first loved us. And why? Why do you love us? I don't know why, but I'm so thankful and grateful that you do. You are amazing. Speak to us this morning in your name, amen. You should take both these passages home and meditate on these. Ephesians 2, 1 to 9. Meditate on this. What does it mean? What does it mean to you instead of me telling you what it means? What do you think it means? What is the Holy Spirit telling you? And I think you will agree at least with a large part of what I'm saying. But he might speak to you as an individual too. What does this mean to you in your life? because this changes everything. And I have been hammering for the last year at least, working it out in my own life, because I, I, I know on one hand I am a wretch, and it's not that I was a wretch, I am a wretch. I can try as hard as I can to be good, and I'm not good. Romans 7 is me. I try and I try and I fail and I fail and I try and I fail. You know, God has rescued me some from horrendous habits. And I would like to say that if you are lost in any addictions or habits, please come and see me. I'm an expert at how to get out of those things. But my character flaws that cause those habits continue to haunt me. And one by one, God is working on them. And I'm saying this because I believe all of you are in this somewhere. And then how do you reconcile? I'm a wretch, but I'm supposed to be a Christian, and I'm supposed to be the salt of the earth, and I'm supposed to be the light on the hill, but I know inside who I really am. I'm a wretch. Well, let me relieve you this morning. You are a wretch, and you're dead. And every time you realize you're a wretch, you just remember, you're dead. You have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer you that lives. It's Christ that lives in you. And you now live by faith. How many times have we repeated this verse? Because it is crucial to your new identity as children of God. Saints. Not because I try really hard, but because he did this for us. His performance, not my performance. His performance, not your performance. And it changes everything now because I now obey because I love him. I obey because I love him. 
and I live in a, in a state of repentance. For as Adam all die, for as in Adam all die, so Adam brought the condition of sin to all of us when he sinned. God didn't, you know, wasn't surprised. He set this up because he wants you to decide on your own free will, do you love him or not? He didn't want to force you to love him. He gave you an option. You don't have to love him if you don't want to. That way it's real love. So as, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. This is not my quote. We're not even sure whose quote it was originally. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. No. He's not a psychologist in the sky that will work out your problems for you. He didn't come to make poor people rich. That's some, something else people preach. Oh, he came to make poor people rich. No. No. He didn't, he didn't come to make un, unhappy people happy. No, he didn't. He came to make dead people live. He came to make dead people live. 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25. He personally carried your sins, my sins, in his body on the cross. We don't know what, you know, a lot of people died at crucifixion. I said this on, on Good Friday. Hundreds of thousands of people died of crucifixion. But what was it like to carry the weight of the world? Not only my sin, your sin, and every human being that ever lived. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. He did this for us. By his wounds you are healed. You'll recognize this from Isaiah. Peter is quoting Isaiah. Once you were like sheep who have wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Jonathan Edwards says, the resurrection of Christ is the most joyful event that ever came to pass. Number one, he is here now. He is alive. And he's in charge. He's sovereign. And he knows exactly what's going on with China and Russia and Canada and Trudeau. You name it. COVID, you name it. He knows exactly what's going on in your bank accounts, exactly what's going on in your heart, exactly what's going on with your grandchildren and your children and your neighbors. And he's in charge. But also, he conquered death. The Bible says that this is the most powerful example of God's power ever. Was Jesus coming out of that grave. And when he conquered death, he conquered death for us. Yes, eternal life after our heart stops. Your heart stops, you're on your deathbed, you can have peace. And you're going to meet Jesus and you're not going to say, well, I tried, I tried. No, 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 no. You're a wretch. You're dead. You're going to say, I'm dead. Jesus lives in me. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. It's not Jesus' performance is why I'm going to heaven. If you don't believe that, you're going to be mighty scared on your deathbed. Because Paul Washer said, and I said this before, but he said, if, if Jesus covered 99.999% of your salvation, you're, you're hooped. Because if you're relying on 1% from you to be saved, 1% because I'm good, 1% because I, I quit drinking and I quit smoking and, and now I don't swear, 1%? Your 1% your is nothing. It's, it's not ever going to pay off for you. Jesus paid 100% for you. 100%. We don't obey him because we want to be saved. We obey him because we are saved. We obey him because we love him. We obey him because we figured out the hard way, most of us, that he's right and we're wrong. His way leads to an abundant life. Our way leads to back into the tomb. We, we keep going back into the dead. We keep going back into that sewer pit. And thank God that we have an advocate sit, standing, sitting at the right hand of the Father that's interceding for us all the time. The resurrection of Christ is the most... Here's another Jonathan Edwards. You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. Meditate on that. Believe it. Because there are many of us here that are thinking that there's, you know, we are doing something. 
to be saved. And we're not. And I think the moment we really capture that is the moment we can stop judging others and start accepting others and forgiving others and, and realizing we are all oh, mourning for our sins. We are all poor in spirit. And we are saints because of Jesus Christ and his love for us. We're not saints because of anything we did and you don't have to try to be and you can stop beating yourself up and stop trying to measure up because you will never measure up. He measures up and you are dead and he now lives in you. My faith rests not in what I am or shall be or feel. It's not your feelings. It's not in what you are or know. It's not your knowledge, but in what Christ is in what he has done and in what he is now doing for me. I'm using quotes from respected ministers of the word. This is Charles Spurgeon. This is not a Bible verse, but this is what the Bible says. I want you to hear it from other people that we respect because I believe this with all my heart. And this is what these verses are telling you. This is what Ephesians 2, 1 to 9 is telling you. My faith rests not in what I am, or shall be or feel or know but in what Christ is I tell myself this every morning because I wake up with this cloud you know Satan's going who are you he's condemning you know I'm sure he does that to you who you think you are I know what you're really like and I go I'm dead it's not about me it's about Jesus and he whooped you <laughs> and he's perfect and I come out my feelings now just follow that very quickly used to take me weeks, now it takes me minutes. I read and I meditate. If you don't remind yourself of the gospel a dozen times a day, you're going to be in that sewer pit. Remind yourself. Remind yourself. It's about Jesus. It's not about you. You're his child. And he's got you. And he loves you. Repenting and confessing all day long. We live in a constant, constant, lifestyle of repenting this is what martin luther i love this someone asked martin luther you guys know who he is right the reformation someone asked martin luther what we contribute to salvation he said sin and resistance sin and resistance that's what we contribute to sal salvation sin and resistance did you know that even your faith is a gift from God. The, the desire to seek him was a gift from God. Your obedience, your, your ability to obey him is a gift from God. We are poor in spirit. Broken. I sang that song because I know that. I remind myself, I, I'm at the cross. Your blood shed for me. A sinner who's lost. Down on my knees. And your broken heart. Broken for me. And all that you ask is that I believe. That's the gospel. Remind yourself of this every day. Jesus actually said, every time you eat, remind yourself of this. Every time you break bread, every time you drink wine, my blood was shed for you. My body was broken for you. Remind yourself, this is his thing. This is what he wants you to know more than anything. And when you really understand that, the power of the Holy Spirit will flood you. And you will be that light on the hill. And you will be the salt of the earth because it's him doing it, not you. And ladies and gentlemen, how many people do you know that you love that are still in that tomb? They're still dead. Yeah, and they're going to hell. But it's not even just hell. I don't want them to live one more day in that tomb. I want them to know Jesus personally. I want them to understand the real meaning of life. And to understand joy for the first time in their lives. Because anybody that doesn't know Jesus has never experienced joy. They've experienced buzzes. Buzzes. Highs and lows. Happiness and sadness. But they've never experienced joy. And joy only comes when you know Jesus. John Newton, he's the guy that wrote Amazing Grace in the 1700s, late 1700s. When we look at the ungodly, non-Christians, we are not to hate them, but to pity them, mourn over them, and pray for them. 
nor have we any right to boast over them, for by nature and of ourselves we are no better than they. We are no better than they. Charles Spurgeon again, when you feel yourself to be utterly unworthy, you have hit the truth. You guys feeling better now? Because you don't have to feel any different than that. You need to feel unworthy because you are. But he is worthy. And you are dead. And he lives in you. And you are now a saint. See, it confuses people. What do you mean? I'm dead, I'm alive, I'm dead, I'm alive. I've got to die to myself. What? What is this? What is it? It's all about love. Don't try to complicate it. It's all about love. It's about loving him. And the more you love him, the more he will speak to you. The more he'll, he'll inter change your life. And he's promised you, seek me first in my righteousness, I'll provide all your needs. You know, I say this, you got money problems? You got money problems? Okay, let me tell you how to solve your money problems. It's not quite what Dave Ramsey would say. Okay, and I'm not against Dave Ramsey. I think he's got some really good advice. But I'm going to tell you the, how to solve your money problems. Take your bank statement at the end of the month, every month, and go through it line by line and repent. You want to solve your money problems? Start by repenting. Line by line. Lord, I can see I wasn't supposed to spend that. Forgive me. Oh, this one? Yeah, you wanted me to spend that? Yeah, you wanted me to spend that? Oh, I see. No, you didn't want me to spend that. I repent. And do that every month until you start listening to him before you spend a dollar. And your money problems will be solved. Seek first him and his righteousness. Your money problems will be solved. And I know this from personal experience. Give him the first fruits. Give him the first fruits of your money. The very best of your check. Not what's left over. Give it to him. Give it to God. Watch what he does. This is not prosperity gospel. This is love. This is a relationship. This is his faith in him. Because we try to save, oh, doing, I'm doing taxes. Oh, well, I'm not going to claim this. And, I will. and that right away, oh, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't have to, you know, cut corners and be deceptive in order to make an extra hundred dollars on my tax return. How ludicrous is that? I can be transparent in his name and... Render unto Caesar's that which is Caesar's. And unto God that which is God. And I can live in the freedom of being transparent and know that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You can't solve your money problems till you start with repentance. We are unworthy. Matthew 27, 52. This is an interesting thing that I want you to notice here. And God didn't do this by accident. And the tombs opened. This is when... Jesus died. He said, it is finished. And the tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. This is physical dead people that came alive. And they left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. The power of God to resurrect Christ seem to overflow into other people's graves. And I don't think this, this, nothing is ever an accident with God. He came to make dead people live. He will give you a new body. You will have a new body. Boy, some of us like me and Les are pretty, we might even have a full head of hair, who knows? You know, maybe we're in shape, I don't know. We're gonna have a new body. There is gonna be new life. You can count on it. Jesus said, if it wasn't true, I wouldn't tell you this. I go to prepare a place for you. A place with many mansions. He's not lying. He never lies. You are going to have a new body. But spiritually, for eternity, you have life. The life that you have is compared to the death that you have. Now, I don't think I have to tell you guys what that death is like. That death is like searching for pleasure, searching for a buzz, searching for meaning, dark, lonely, something missing in your heart, anger, bitterness, addiction. You guys have all been dead. 
I've been dead, and some of us choose to be dead even after we met Jesus. We choose to go back inside the tomb because we think maybe that bottle of beer or whatever, that bottle of whiskey or that drug or, or that sex problem or, or that job or, or playing on stage, that was a big one for me, being on stage, that'll give me meaning in life. Some of us even have transferred our children into that tomb. If I worship, I give everything to my child, my life will be complete. Well, you just wait till they're 13 and see what happens. Wait till they're 18 and see what happens. If you play your cards right, they'll come back at 32. Children are not reliable. Spouses are not reliable. There is only one rock, and that's Jesus Christ. He's reliable forever. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those that believe in his name. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. And he spoils his children and he loves his children and he does not forsake them. He does not leave them. Nothing can separate you from his love. Not even hell, not even you, not even your bad habits. Nothing can separate you from his love. You are his child for eternity. That's your identity. All these people struggling with their identity these days. Isn't that something? Some of them think they're cats. Some guys think they're girls. Some girls think they're guys. Some people think that I'm a biker. That's my identity. I'm a biker. Some people think I'm a farmer. Some people think, well, I'm a, I'm a, a rigger. I remember when I was on the rigs. It was our own culture, right? We're riggers. We're not civilians. We work 12 hours a day and 20 days straight and... We know how to work like real men, so that's our identity. Some people think it's your preacher or a musician. That is not your identity. There's nothing to do. Because a musician, you can get Parkinson's, you can't play anymore. And I've seen it happen. You can be a rigger and you get to be 65, they're not going to hire you. You're not going to do any more hitches, you're done. You put your identity as I'm a husband, your, your spouse can die. And all of a sudden you've lost your identity. I've seen people that built their identity on I'm the manager at McDonald's or I'm a taxi driver or this is not your identity. Your identity is not a husband, not a wife, not a mother, not a father. Your identity is your child of God. That is the only identity that is eternal. Always remind yourself that. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. And it's because of his performance, not yours. Once you were dead, I'm just going to read this and let it just soak in. I'm not going to say much about it. Just try to meditate on this. And, and this week you got homework. I want you to meditate on this. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very, nat but our very nature, we were subject to God's anger. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much. That even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. This is where you are now. You're not in the tomb anymore. You're in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. As shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believe. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it.
Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you. We humble ourselves here on Easter Sunday and we're meditating on what it means that you, to be united with you, what it means, what you've actually done for us. That even though we constantly fail and we're messing up and we can never achieve that holiness by gritting our teeth, by trying really hard, by, by sacrificing so many things, but you don't require us to do that because it is finished. You did it for us. And that we're meditating on what that means to be your child. To be holy, white as snow, completely perfected. That you see us, Lord, through your lens, the lens of Jesus. That you see us exactly as spotless as he is, as you are, Lord. God, let that sink into our bones. Let that sink into the depths of our heart. Let that transform our minds. That our identity, because of you, and only because of you, we are children of God. Warriors in your army. Filled with your Holy Spirit. And because of you, and only because of you, mountains will move. Giants will fall dead people will live. We pray now, Lord, for those people that are still in the tomb that don't know you, family members, neighbors, enemies. God, we, we, we fervently pray together here this morning. Don't let them live one more day without knowing you, Lord. Don't let them go to hell. Roll the stone away. Raise them from the dead, Lord. Give them life the way you've given us life. Have mercy on, on the gay community, the alphabet community. Have mercy, Lord, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. Have mercy on our politicians and those that have made these laws that are absolute abomination to who you are. Have mercy on them. Have mercy on the voters. Have mercy on the Muslims. Have mercy on the Buddhists. Have mercy on the Wiccans. Have mercy on the atheists. Have mercy on our neighbors, our friends, our children, our grandchildren, our enemies. Have mercy, Lord, the way that you have had mercy on us. God, don't let us get in the way of your love for the world, your love for every drunk, your love for every drug addict, your love for everyone who is lost in that tomb. God, bring revival amongst your church. Let us hug and cry and beg forgiveness from one another. And Lord, give us the opportunity for that with other churches, with other Christians, with Christians that are no longer with us here. And God, bring awakening as a result, awakening with all those still in the tomb, lost and dead around us, Lord. We pray this for your glory.